Hi, this is Mark Birch, and this is a quick revision of Adam Forbes' On Her Blindness. The poem's title appears to be an intertextual link to John Milton's Sonnet 19, when I consider how my light is spent, and it would be understandable to wonder how this can possibly be an intertextual link. But many people refer to this poem as On His Blindness, uh, which um, is a poem written by Milton to explore how he felt about becoming blind in 1654 and his ongoing stoicism with regard to being blind. The intertextuality provides Thorpe with the opportunity to present an ironic contrast between the stoicism of Milton and the absolute lack of stoicism that's evident in the character of the mother in On Her Blindness. Far from enduring suffering without complaint, Thorpe presents the mother as not being able to bear being blind. The alliteration of plosives there conveying the strength of feeling through the powerful plosive sounds. The phrase, one shouldn't say it, seems to be a recognition from the poetic voice that uh, the mother's attitude is rejected by society. It's taboo. Um, instead, there really should be a societal expectation that there is a stoicism that's similar to that of Milton. The poetic voice's recognition of the societal expectation of stoicism in the face of disability is maintained in the second stanza. Despite the hyperbolic use of the adjective catastrophic and the metaphor of hell to capture the extreme suffering caused by some handicaps, the poetic voice knows that they should hide this attitude. The stress created by the alliteration of the intense huh reinforces the sense of unrelenting suffering that must be endured. The idiom, bear it like a Roman, ostensibly captures the need to accept suffering without complaint, another demand for stoicism. But the phrase may be derived from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, Act 4, Scene 3, like a Roman, bear the truth. One must accept the truth of a handicap, but do so with strength and without emotional expression. The reference to a Paris restaurant, with its connotations of luxury, romance and fine dining, functions as a very positive image. This renders the following horrific incident even more terrible, given the contrast to this setting. The mother's inability to get the food to stay on her fork may be represented by the alliteration of f. The multiplicity of the sound could capture the multiplicity of attempts. This difficulty could also be conveyed structurally through the stanza enjambment. The absence at the end of stanza three and anticipation of the rest of the sentence could mirror the frustrating absence of food on the mother's fork. The frequent use of enjambment throughout the poem serves to make the reader falter, undermining the fluidity of reading in the same way as the blind mother's movements inevitably falter. And this is also complemented by the frequent use of zizura, halting the reader. Thorpe employs the image of hell for the second time, this time through the idiomatic direct speech of the mother. The repetition, coupled with dysphemistic language use, reveals the agony experienced by the mother. The personal nature of the mother's suffering is conveyed by the use of direct speech and reinforced by the use of the poet's own name, Adam. The apparently autobiographical nature of the experience renders it all the more poignant. Given the intertextuality of the poem's title, it may be appropriate to suggest that Adam could also allude to the Miltonic Adam from Paradise Lost, closely associated with the loss of paradise, the same way that the mother has lost her world of sight. Bump myself off is a rather discordant euphemism to employ within the context of feeling that she must take her own life. It seems that the legacy of shame associated with a response that's not stoical informs the mother's language choices. The flippancy associated with euphemism can also be seen in the poetic voice's response, which he doesn't recall, presumably because it lacked significance, being the usual sop used to dismiss or awkwardly placate someone with intense emotional needs. Forbes clearly addressing the way in which society fails to facilitate open expression of emotion. This lack of openness is clear in the poetic voice's description of themselves as the locked-in son. The metaphor captures the persona's lack of emotional openness and inability to meaningfully engage with his mother's distress. It's also ironic that he describes himself as locked in when his mother is locked out of the world of sight. The simile, like a dodgem, is light-hearted given the fairground ride's connotations of fun. The image also conveys frequent bumps, which seems to be in stark contrast to the mother's attempts to preserve her dignity 
perhaps suggesting the mother's self-control and resolve as she loses her sight. The direct speech of the poetic voice's father, no built-in compass, and the son's reference to the dodgem may imply that the family used humour in order to appear stoical, avoiding their true feelings. The same is true of the mother who laughed it off, although she pretended to ignore the void. Given that she only pretended to ignore, the poet makes it clear that the void is conspicuous to her. This vast emptiness is not something that can be laughed off, making the mother's pretense futile and tragic. The reference to void may function as a biblical allusion to John 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The absolute darkness before the creation of light conveys the absolute emptiness in the mother's vision. The alienation that's produced by blindness may be conveyed by the structural choices Falk makes with the presentation of the void, Enjambment before and caesura after effectively cut off the phrase, symbolically reinforcing the absence that the void characterises. The tragedy of the situation is maintained by Forp's reference to the manner in which the mother smiled at her grandchildren's attempts to show her things. They attempt to connect through the visual medium, offering drawings or showing her toys, things we know she cannot truly respond to. The protracted decay of the mother's vision is captured by the poet's use of consonants in the long, slow slide. The the phoneme is a long, protracted sound, and it's complemented by the long, sibilant sounds in slow slide that had finished in a vision. The chromomorphic simile, as blank as stone, represents the final lifelessness of the mother's sight. Now, this is a bit of a stretch, but the reference to stone could also connote a gravestone, symbolising the death of vision and foreshadowing the mother's own death. Maybe. The mother attempts to hide her blindness by engaging in activities that rely on sight. The first is driving the old Lanchester. The make of car may be symbolically significant, given that Lanchester ended production of vehicles in 1955. She's associated with a vehicle that's now defunct, perhaps mirroring how the mother is represented as feeling about herself. The other activities are presented through an asyndetic list. She'd visit exhibitions, admire films, sink into television. And this suggests the endless ways in which she pretended to see, although the pretense is shockingly undermined following stanza enjambment, while looking the wrong way. The poet takes us to a moment in the last week of his mother's life, a fortnight back, so her death is presented as very recent. This moment is described through a series of metaphors that capture the beauty and preciousness of the environment at that time. The weather is described as golden, and coupled with the royal ground, this conveys a sense of preciousness, but it's something of value that's inaccessible to the mother given her blindness. The metaphors are dominated by colour, again something inaccessible to the mother. The weather is golden, the trees are ablaze with the reds of autumn, and the ground is royal in the sense of a red carpet of fallen leaves. The lack of empathy for the mother is regretted when the poetic voice admits that they told her this, forgetting that she would not be able to enjoy the sight. And the tragedy is strengthened by the mother's continued pretense of Oh yes, I know, it's lovely out there, while well, staring at nothing. The poem concludes with a reference to the mother's death. In death she remains sightless, but there appears to be a suggestion of solace in Now she can't pretend. The final couplet concludes with It was up to us to believe. Once again, this seems to allude to the pretense that's dominated the poem. While the pretense in life was tragic and flawed, there's more hope in death that others can believe her to have sight in an afterlife. The final isolated line, the only single line in the poem, structurally captures the loneliness and isolation that follows the mother's death. However, the hope that stems from belief is also evident in the internal rhyme between pretend and end. The rhyme fosters a sense of resolution and harmony provided by the release of death and a Miltonic hope of a better afterlife. 
The poem's form is that of an elegy, given that it deals with death, the literal death of the mother and the figurative death of her sight. And that's also the end of this video. So hope that was helpful. Cheers, ta. Created using Powtoon.